David, in Judaism, how important is free will? Uh, there's a very powerful tension. In fact, it's so powerful, I myself don't know quite what to believe. Uh, let me describe it this way. Um, I'll give you some considerations and texts on either side. On the one hand, the Bible tells you, you have two choices before you. Do the good, do the bad. It's the choice you have between life and death. And that seems to be set out as a very dramatic presentation of you have these two possibilities. There's a, there's a forked path here. You choose which, say, which way to go. And you have the free will to do it. And you have the free will to do it. And Maimonides affirms the existence of free will very vigorously. He sees it as a uh, precondition of, of repentance. Um, another indication that Jewish philosophers uh, put a great value on free will, or I should say that some Jewish philosophers, is that they get very exercised over an episode that happens in the Bible where God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. Uh, it's a process that's repeated with other protagonists in the Bible. And they wonder, how can God take away a person's free will? So they're putting a lot of value on, on free will. Um, also, one of the standard theodicies, one of the standard explanations of evil, is that evil is necessary because it's a product of human free will, and God puts a higher priority on free will than, than he does upon, let's say, happiness and, and, and other sorts of goods. Uh, so that's all on the one hand, a kind of affirmation of the significance of free will. But there are also some indicators on the other side uh, that not everyone endorses this position. Um, first of all, look at the Bible itself. When the Bible presents you with those two choices, it's telling you if you choose this way, you'll be rewarded. If you choose this way, you'll be punished. That's a coercive factor <laughs> there. Um, secondly, in the liturgy, we pray to God, the chofes yitzreinu lahishtabedloch, force our will to be subjugated to you. So we ask God to do this for us. I mean, we had the freedom to ask him, but once he does what we're asking, he's essentially depriving us, in a sense, of our free will with respect to that request. Um, in Hasidic thought, uh, you have the idea that God causes absolutely everything, um, and therefore there is no free will. Uh, or I should say, in some of the schools, uh, the only free will that you have is the free will to realize that God is causing everything. Uh, there's a very fascinating approach also to the book of Genesis as taken by Nachmanides. Um, Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden because, in God's words, they became yodei tova ra. They came to know the difference between good and evil. Of course, the obvious question is, why wouldn't God want them to have that? And Nachmanati says that originally when they were created, they automatically would do what is good and stay away from that which was bad. But that implies no free will. That would imply no free will. And that's Nachmanati's point. That was the original state. The fall, as it were, is the fall into a situation where it's not only the good that looks attractive to you sometimes, but sometimes you're attracted by the bad. Now, of course, there's a difficulty here, because if they really automatically did the good, then how did they ever sin in the first place? But still, that's, that's not one of these positions, which I find very fascinating, because it suggests that doing the right thing is more important than having free will. And he sees God later in history, maybe around Messianic times, uh, circumcising the hearts of the Jews, to, to quote from Deuteronomy, um, which again implies uh, the, the deprivation of free will for, uh, for another cause. Uh, another very fascinating uh, thinker in this subject is Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler, who was a very significant rabbinic figure in uh, the city of uh, B'nai Brak, at least that, that was sort of the last uh, uh, place where he was the leader in Israel. in Israel. He died in 1953, and um, he certainly would not be classified as a friend of philosophy. Uh, at the same time, um, he was a very interesting thinker with a lot of ideas that have a certain profundity to them. Um, one of them involves free will, uh, where he says that essentially most of the choices that we make are either products of our environment or the products of previous choices that we make. You conquer certain territory, and then you move on to new territory. Every person always has what he calls a nikudat habachira, a point of choice. Some point, there is some, some small area in which you can choose. 
your objective in life, your goal, should be to turn yourself, convert yourself from someone who is a chooser to someone whose actions are necessitated by the good. So he winds up in the same place as Nachmanides, but with a twist. The twist is that you, ha- you should exercise your free will to we'll reach eliminate. the point when you're necessitated. <laughs> Whereas in Nachmanides, you don't have that, that step. Um, these are some of the uh, sources that I find very fascinating uh, and uh, lead to the idea that maybe free will is not always you know, what it's uh, cracked up to be. Uh, even if I may just return to the example of Pharaoh, um, there's a kind of uh, disconnect between the uh, emphasis that the philosophers have on free will and the way the Bible looks at it. Now, a lot of philosophers try to say, well, Pharaoh ultimately had free will, and they figure out a way to do that, and some of them are quite ingenious and quite compelling. At the same time, the Bible says, well, deprive, I deprive Pharaoh of free will in order, to multiply, right, in order to multiply my wonders in the land of Egypt. Um, I think a good way to think about this is by, uh, by means of a thought, a question that was raised by uh, uh, the late philosopher Robert Nozick, where Nozick introduced the notion of tracking bestness, hmm. which means if an action is good, you do it, an action is bad, you don't. And he asked the question, which is really better, tracking bestness or free will, doing the good or having a choice to do the bad? Hmm. Essentially, Nachmanides' question. Yeah. And it's a fascinating and a very powerful question and that's why there's a lot of confusion in my mind and probably in the minds of others who've uh, studied this topic as to which is more valuable, uh, free will or automatically doing the good.